Hey everyone, welcome to Rock Hill Online. We're so happy you chose to join us this morning. We don't normally meet like this, but we are still expecting that the God of the universe is with us today and every day. He is still in control, and we all still have a part to play in his story. We may be physically distant, but we are still gathered together to lift up a shout of praise to Jesus. Church was never about the buildings or the services. It's always been about God's people living for his gain. So no matter where you're joining us from this morning, and no matter what you believe, our invitation is this. Come experience Jesus with us. Good morning, Rock Hill. I want to extend a welcome to you on this beautiful, beautiful spring morning. For those of you who are online, good morning. For those of you who are here, we're going to ask you to stand. We're going to begin this morning with some musical worship. Um, so will you sing with us? <clears throat> An orphan lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear you call but Father, you worked your will I had no righteousness on my own I had no right to draw near your throne but Father, you loved me still Hand in love before you laid the world's foundation you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. home to seek out the lost you knew the great and terrible cost but Jesus your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone nothing I did could ever atone but Jesus you paid my debt by your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you had sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The spirit you made me. I swore I knew the way on my own Head full of rocks, a heart made of stone The spirit you moved in me At your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened On my darkened heart the light of Christ has shone Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven sin is sin by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace. I will reach the end by grace and grace
campus pastor. And if you were wondering, um, for today, Chester Park, we couldn't meet in our facility, so we decided to come over and join Lincoln Park. So you're going to see a whole bunch of Chester Parkers here today, and so there'll be some in this service and the afternoon service as well, or the later service as well. So we're glad that you're here again, and I just want to remind you that we're here to worship the Lord. Pastor Kyle is going to continue in his series to the book of James, and today we're going to be thinking about how God has a plan on how we should conduct our lives and live out our lives, and it's best when we do it his way. And so with that in mind, I want to read from Proverbs chapter 3 this morning as our call to worship. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithlessness, faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make, your, will make straight your paths. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so grateful that we're able to meet today. <laughs> and joyful that we can come together as two different campuses and worship as one body in Christ. And as we worship you and hear from the preaching of your word today, may we be reminded that you have created us and you know best. And would we follow your ways for your glory and for what's best for us. And so we ask that you would be with us today as we worship you in Jesus' great name I pray this. Amen. Here we stand on this foundation, hope as an anchor, faith as our flag, the cross as our courage, your word as our way. Through wars and rumors of wars, still you are sovereign, still you are Lord, above the confusion. stands for you have not not for a moment abandoned your promise to save and you will not not for a moment withdraw your
watch the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade this morning as the almighty God is the true God. You are the God who through the words of your mouth spoke creation into existence. And God, you continue to bring dead things to life. Through the work of Christ, you have brought our dead hearts to life in Christ. And in that, we rejoice this morning. May that truth be what fuels the way we live that we might proclaim the goodness of the God that we serve, and that we might bring others and invite them into living under your good rule. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, good morning. I would like you guys to meet Mackenzie Warner. Mackenzie, why don't you come on up? She's got some exciting things to share with us about Compassion International. Hi. 
My name is Mackenzie, and welcome. Today is Compassion Sunday. I can't wait to see what God does for us today. I'd like to begin by sharing my story with you. Sorry. <laughs> Back in September, I began two very special relationships with Wilson and Abigail. Wilson lives in Nicaragua. He's eight years old, and he loves running, jumping, and playing. But he unfortunately lives in poverty. Abigail is, she also lives in Nicaragua, and she's eight. She loves playing with dolls and learning about Jesus. Her favorite Bible characters are Adam and Eve, and she lives in poverty. I was connected with these great kids through an organization called Compassion International. If you've never heard of them, it is an organization dedicated to releasing children in pov poverty in Jesus' name. They do so by connecting children living in poverty with a loving sponsor, someone like you and me. Uh, my sponsorship connects Wilson and Abigail to a church in their community that ensures their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs are cared for, plus allows us to create a meaningful relationship by exchanging letters a few times a year. I'd love to share with you why I think sponsorship is so powerful and why I think you should consider sponsoring a child yourself. In September, I was here at Youth Group, and a video about Compassion International was on, and I really felt God pushing me towards a sponsorship. And that night, I was reading Galatians, and this verse stuck out to me, and it made me start a sponsorship the very next day. Only, they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do, Galatians 2.10. There are so many kids in poverty, and through compassion, these kids are given hope. Every kid needs to be reminded that they are valuable, that God has a plan for their life, and that there is hope. And today, I would like to invite you to provide that hope for a child living in poverty. This is a great opportunity to answer calls for... God to care for the poor, and when you say yes to a sponsorship, you offer to help a child who desperately needs it. Your sponsorship connects a child with a local church, and it'll help to ensure his or her growth and development, and you can build a relationship with them. If you feel like God is calling you to sponsor, please make your way to the back after the service, and I will be at the table to help you in any way I can. This is a powerful chance to join Christians all across the country, serving and answering the holy call, a call to help. I can't wait to see how God moves in this church. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mackenzie. Mackenzie, what grade are you in? 10th Tenth. Tenth grade. She's already sponsoring a couple kids. Awesome. One of the things that I often pray in our staff meeting, and Josh can attest to this, is that what God does in our middle school and high schoolers would provoke us and begin leading us. Most of the revivals that start either start with students, college students or even younger and uh, we have much to learn, don't we? We're going to take just a couple minutes now. It's great to see everybody. <laughs> and we're going to just say hi to each other. Uh, when we gather together, we think it's absolutely vital that we connect with God and his word. But also, a huge part of our worship is that we connect with one another. So I'm going to just give you a few minutes to re-meet people and, and find out what they really look like. So why don't you guys take a couple minutes, and, and then we'll be in James chapter 4. All right, if you want to find your way back to your seats, you can turn in your Bibles to James chapter 4. Hey, over the last month, we've been doing a giving campaign for the Youth Center over in Superior, and Lord willing that that'll one day be a Rock Hill campus as well. Uh, we set out to raise $50,000. As of last Sunday, we raised $53,218.51. So... Thank you, God. He did it, and he used you guys to do that. And so we are excited. Uh, don't worry. The work is not done yet. There is plenty of work to do. Um, change your cell phone number now, or Josh will find you. <laughs> this 
room was filled with women yesterday for the Rock Hill Women's Day, and so if there's a lot of ladies in here looking tired, it's because they had an epic amount of fun yesterday. I'm so glad some of you made it. Most of you will probably be here at 1045. So let's pray and ask God to open our minds to the truth and beauty of his word. God, thank you that you are a God who speaks. Thank you, God, that you know the inworkings of our heart and our life even better than we do. And so, God, would you give us insight into how we work today? Not just that we might have insight, but that we might live at peace with one another. God, would you guide us into conflict and help us to seek first your kingdom above all else? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to every single person today. Speak through me or in spite of me, but speak, we ask, in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. If you've ever been to Rock Hill's Pizza with the Pastor, it's something that we do once a month downstairs. It's kind of a get to know Rock Hill and see if this is the place that you're maybe going to call your church family. One of the first things that I always tell people, I assure them, Rock Hill is not a perfect church. And there's a couple reasons for that. The first one is that I'm her pastor, or one of them. And if you get to know me, you will realize that I am incredibly flawed. This gospel that I preach week in and week out, I actually need to. That I am not justified and declared righteous before God on the basis of my own goodness, but rather what Jesus has done for me. And so the gospel is not just good news for everybody else, it's good news for me. Now, the second reason Rock Hill is not a perfect church is that you're here. You're welcome. In fact, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it. You'll screw it up. I mean that. Now, I say this tongue-in-cheek, but, but I really do believe this. If you think that any group of sinners that is saved by God's extraordinary grace is going to be perfect all of the time, you are setting yourself up for disillusionment. If you think that you're never going to experience conflict or disappointment in a local church, you haven't been around a local church very long. And yet, something deeply in us shatters when we experience the junk of the church. Isn't that true? See, it's so much easier for me and probably you to have grace in my life toward non-believers, those who don't claim the name of Jesus Christ, than it is for me to have grace toward fellow believers. See, part of that is that we expect certain shots to come from those who don't believe in Jesus and treasure Jesus and see the wisdom in Jesus' words and commandments. But when it comes to those who follow Jesus, our expectations are different. And in some ways, they should be. Because we know that Jesus calls us to love our neighbor as ourself. He even calls us to sacrificially love those that we have previously considered to be our enemies and show them his love and grace. This means that we don't lie to each other. We don't gossip about one another. It means that we fight to believe the best about each other. And most of the time, we use our words to build one another up rather than to tear each other down. And yet, one of the things that I can guarantee you will be a part of any church family that, you're, that you ever experience is this, conflict. It will happen. Conflict is inevitable. Stick around long enough, and you will see that there are sinners in the church because every church is made up of sinful people that God saves, not by their moral improvement, but by his extravagant grace. And not only does he save us into something, but he actually gives us a task to do together. And sometimes we're shocked when sparks fly. Not only that, but every single person who is a follower of Jesus is in this process that the Bible calls sanctification. What's sanctification? It's the gradual process where God continues to reshape and reform you from the old person into the new, into the image of Jesus, that we become more and more and more like him. We, we put off the old man or the old woman, as it were, and we put on Christ so that, not perfectly, I've often found that it's five steps forward and four steps back, three steps forward, two steps back, but this gradual improvement where we become more and more and more like Jesus, but often happens 
in the midst of our own sin and our own rebellion. Um, here, here's what I found. When we do that together, often the sparks that fly, the forgiveness that needs to be sought, the things that it surfaces, is the very process that God uses to refine us. See, being in community, being around other people, often forces me to deal with things that I wouldn't have to deal with otherwise. See, when I'm, when I'm just being selfish on my own, often people don't notice that. But when I allow that to spill over into other people's lives, I see the very real ramifications and I'm forced to deal with it because it actually hurts people. Every church in human history has experienced this tension of conflict. Those, those who say, you know, I just want to get back to the early days of the church of Acts probably have not read Acts very carefully. In fact, most of the letters in the New Testament are written to these very churches that we look at through rose-colored glasses because there's a conflict in their midst, because there's false teaching in their midst, because there's all kinds of stuff that exists there in addition to the good. In chapter 4 of James, Jesus' half-brother turns his attention to the conflict that exists within the church, within the scattered disciples of Jesus throughout the Roman Empire. And just as he's been throughout the entire letter, he is annoyingly practical. He forces us to reckon with the question, does your faith work in the midst of conflict? See, the title of this series, James, Faith That Works, kind of has a double meaning. First, it means that our faith should produce good works in us, a a different orientation to our life that we now live under Jesus' rule and reign, and because of that, we produce good works from our life. But a faith that works is also a faith that works in the everyday stuff of life, conflict included. So let's read James chapter 4, the first 10 verses, and we'll see what he has to say about conflict that exists. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be torn to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. See, the, the key to understanding conflict in your life is to understand that in any conflict you have, there is a battle that is being waged on three different planes. There is a conflict among you or among us, conflict that we have with other people. There is a conflict within you, a battle raging in your own heart and soul. And there is a conflict above you when we think about the spiritual powers at work in this world. See, in every conflict that you experience, there is a conflict among you, a conflict within you, and a conflict above you. And when you understand these things, it doesn't fix it, but it gives you insight into how we conceive of a battle plan. First of all, there is a conflict that is among you. This is the obvious that's taking place among the people of God that James is writing to you. There's conflict that exists between people because people are different, especially sinful people. Between you and someone else, between you and, or between someone that you know and someone else that you know, and you love them both and you find yourself in the middle. Possibly even conflict that exists between you and your spouse or you and your roommate or you and your children. James asked the question, what causes quarrels among you? 
What caused this conflict? Now, if you're a normal human being, the most natural response to the question, what caused this conflict, is they did. It's their fault. If they wouldn't have been stupid or thoughtless or cruel or irresponsible or uncaring or sinners, we wouldn't be having this problem. The problem's you. Oh, there. It's the most natural way for us to think about conflict, isn't it? It's not my problem. It's not my fault. They did it. And the reality is there's often plenty of evidence that justifies this particular position, isn't there? I mean, people can be stupid and thoughtless and uncaring and lazy and cruel and unresponsible. James acknowledges what, there are, that there are quarrels and fights among you. And sometimes in verse 2, they even lead you to coveting and, and to murder. Now, this is most likely a, a hyperbole. I'm, I'm guessing there was an actual murder that was taking place between Christians. Most scholars think that. But as Jesus, James' older brother, told us in the Sermon on the Mount, there's lots of ways to murder people without using our fist. In fact, James himself has just spent a chapter telling us about the destructive power of our words, that the tongue, even though it's so tiny, can be like the smallest spark that ignites an entire forest fire. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is one of the biggest lies that we continue to perpetuate. I wish it were different. But there is conflict that exists among us. And so long as there is lingering sin in the world, there will be conflict. And so the question becomes, how will we deal with it? How will we navigate our way through it? Here's the challenging part of the church. The church from time to time gives us a glimpse of the future kingdom that is to come. We are, after all, the people of God who live under the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. We are, after all, those who are devoted to a different kingdom reign. And so we are living as part of the future kingdom, even back in the here and now. But I've also learned that we do that imperfectly, don't we? See, the church is a kingdom outpost, but it just gives a glimpse of what the future kingdom is. It gives us a taste of what is to come, but serves like an appetizer before the main course. It's never more than that. We see glimpses, we get tastes, and we long for the great feast. We long for the church to actually be that. But it never lives up. You ever wrestle with that? I do all the time. Sometimes it feels like there are two choices that we can make. We can either give up our ideals and say, well, I guess we're just like everybody else. Or we can hang on to our idealistic understanding of the church and And nothing ever measures up. You ever feel that tension? I do all the time. What helps me to to navigate my way through that is to understand the already but not yet aspect of the kingdom of God. When Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of God is upon you. The rule and the reign of heaven is breaking into this earth so that where my rule goes, things are restored and they are restored fully. And we see that not only in the message of Jesus, but we see that in the power of Jesus where he walks around and those who are sick are healed. Those who are possessed by demons are set free. Those who are lame walk. Those who are deaf hear. He even raises the dead. He begins to reverse all of the effects of the fall. And yet, not everybody gets healed. Even in the work of the apostles, we see some of the exact same things taking place. The blind see, the deaf hear. But not everybody. See, there is an already but not yet aspect to the kingdom of God. And and here's the thing. You feel it every single day, don't you? There are things that God does through you that are absolutely incredible. Right? Where you realize... There was another power that was clearly at work in my life in there. I, 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 did, I can't measure up to that. And then, the same people, you guys, me, we fall into the same patterns of besetting sin, don't we? Causing in us an aching, a groaning, Jesus, would you just make me the way that I'm supposed to be? Do you feel that? I feel that every day of my life. Why am I not what I want to be? What I want to do, I do not do. And what I do not want to do, I end up doing. Who will save me from this wretched body of sin? That's what Paul says in Romans 7. 
the same thing that exists in your life, I think also exists in the church. We see moments of utter clarity where we are getting a glimpse of the future kingdom brought into this world, and it is beautiful. There's nothing prettier to see the self-sacrifice of people laying down their lives, laying down their fortunes in order to care for one another. And then we say, see in the next week those same exact people gossiping about each other, wronging one another, thinking the worst about each other. Why? Because you're here and I'm here. And the work that God has begun is a glimpse, it is a taste, and it gets us to long for more, but it is not the full meal. That's the best way to make peace with it. You don't give up the ideal, you continue pursuing that with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But you realize that until Jesus comes back, it will not be perfect. And that allows us to continue to bear with one another, doesn't it? See, when we experience conflict among us about masks, about politics, about as a result of gossip or because someone was less than truthful in interacting with us, where does this come from? To simply say it's your fault is way too simple. Now, James tells us we must look within. And when we do, we realize that there is a completely different battle that is raging within us, simultaneous with the conflict that's raging among us. See, the conflict within you, he describes in the first three verses. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. See, Jesus told us the answer back in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, as he's talking to his disciples, he says, it is not what goes into the mouth, food, that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this is what defiles a person. Jesus, in this lengthy this lengthy discord about clean and unclean, says, the problem with the world is our hearts and what comes out of them, not what goes into our bodies. The problem, he says, is not primarily out there, but primarily in here. When it comes to conflict and the conflict that rages among us, the primary problem is actually in here, in me and in you. More specifically, James says, your passions or your desires are at war within you. You desire and covet, but do not have. So you murder, you strike with your fists or with your words. Now, all of us can relate to desiring things. We all do that. That's natural. That's human nature. But there's a big jump that exists between desire and murder, right? I mean, I'm glad that there's a gap that exists between I want that and I'm going to kill you for that. Whew. But what exactly is going on in our hearts that cause us to say, I want that, to now I'm going to kill you if I don't get it? What happens is actually far more subtle than we would like to imagine and happens all the time when we blow up in anger at other people. Remember about 15 years ago, I read the book Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands by Paul David Tripp. He's a man from Philadelphia. And one of the main points of that book was his teaching on James chapter 4 and understanding what happens in our hearts when our desire move beyond good and godly desire. He says there's really six stages that take place, and if you have a smartphone, you can snap a picture of that. It'll probably be something that you want later on, or you can write it down if you're a note taker. He says, we often move from desire to demand. Demand turns into a need. A need turns into an expectation. An expectation, when it isn't met, turns into disappointment. And when we're disappointed, we feel, that we feel justified in punishing either someone else or God. Let me just slow down and walk you through that. Stage one is desire, signified by the the words, I want. See, the, the object of most of our desires are not inherently evil, but rather good desires for good things that God has made. The problem is when they tend to grow beyond a good desire so that they begin to control the passions and the desires of our heart. See, all human desire must be held in submission to a greater purpose, the desire for God and for his kingdom first and foremost. 
And when they begin to slip away, we, we slide down a slippery slope from desire to demand, which is stage two. Demand moves from I want to I must. Demand is beginning to close my fist over a often good desire. And when this happens, I'm, not, I'm no longer comforted by God's desires for me. I now see God's desire for me as a threat because what God's will is potentially stands in the way of my demand. You ever experienced that? We all have. The morphing then of my desire changes my relationship to other people. I now enter the room loaded with a silent demand. You must help me get what I want. Desire becomes a demand which progresses then to a need. A need is signified by saying, I will, I will have it. I now view the thing that I want as essential to my life. This is a devastating step that leads us full-blown into idolatry and slavery. It has become an idol or a God replacement in my heart, something that I need in order to be happy or satisfied. And often, we christen our wants into needs when we take something that we want, like cake, and we turn it to the level of air or oxygen that we need in order to survive. So a desire becomes a demand, which becomes a need, which leads to an expectation. Expectation is you should. If I'm convinced that I need something and that you say you love me, it seems right to expect that you'll help me to get it. The dynamic of this improper, need-driven expectation is the source of all kinds of conflict in relationship. Let me just give you a little free advice. This might change your marriage or your other relationships. An expectation is only valid if it's both communicated and agreed upon. Now, some of you guys, you're like, that sounds vague. That will actually blow your minds. An expectation is only a valid expectation if you communicate it and if they agree to it. Because one of the most frustrating things in the world for any of us is for someone to get frustrated at us because we didn't meet an expectation we didn't know was there. Every couple in the first year of their marriage discovers all kinds of expectations that are there that have never been communicated. Come on, I got to get an amen from that. But not too loud because you're supposed to sit next to you. Right? The first year of marriage is all about discovering all the expectations that were there that you had no idea of. You just thought that was the way it went. Or maybe, have you ever had a boss that held you accountable to an expectation that you had no idea existed? You're like, I would have been happy to do that if I would have known that it was there. A need often turns into an expectation, which then leads to, as we've been seeing in these funny examples, disappointment. You didn't. There's a direct relationship between expectation and disappointment. And much of our disappointment in relationships is not because people have actually wronged us, but because they have failed to meet our expectations. Finally, when it gives birth fully, it leads to punishment. Because you didn't, now I will. We're hurt and we're angry because people who say they love us seem insensitive to our needs. So we strike back in a variety of ways to punishment for their wrongs against us. We include everything from the silent treatment, which is a form of bloodless murder, where I don't kill you but act as if you don't exist, to horrific acts of violence and abuse. I'm angry because you have broken the laws of my kingdom. God's kingdom has been supplanted. I am no longer motivated by love for God and other people so that I use things in my life to express that love. Instead, I love things and use people and even the Lord to get them. My heart has been captured. I am in active service of the creation and the result can only be chaos and conflict in my relationships. Let me tell a story directly from his book. It's Paul Tripp's story, which I think might cause the light bulbs to go off in all of our mind. To show you how something really good can get really ugly in a hurry. He writes, a humbling example from my own life took place on Wednesday night. I was driving home particularly exhausted. I love to cook and I find it relaxing, so I stopped and bought the ingredients for a traditional Cuban meal. I could hear the meat sizzling in the pan. I could smell the wonderful combination of tomato and garlic and cumin and lemon. You can tell I didn't write this story because I'm not sure I like all those things. 
I left the grocery store tired but happy, thinking about how much my wife would appreciate the meal since she was born and raised in Cuba. I was thinking about how our children love black beans and rice and how they would appreciate me as well. We're so blessed. We have a dad who cooks. The vision of a happy family and a relaxed dad made me smile as I drove into the garage. But I was not even out of my car when my daughter greeted me and said she needed a ride downtown, nearly an hour round trip. I couldn't believe it. I could already feel my emotional temperature rising. I was not yelling, but I drove her downtown in silent irritation. On the way back, I gave myself the, this always happens to me speech. A few blocks from home, Luella, his wife, called on my cell phone to tell me that she had to see someone on her way home from work. She suggested that I not wait for her for supper. She also asked me to run to the store because Darnay, our high school son, didn't have a thing for his lunch the next day. With my wonderful Cuban meal decaying in the trunk, I drove past our house to another grocery store. This time, I was not a happy man. I flung the lunch items in the basket, and when I got to the checkout line, I was quite irritated at the elderly lady in front of me who couldn't find a pen to write her check. I finally arrived home an hour and a half later to find Darnay standing in the door with a paper in his hands. On the paper were the exact specifications for a scientific calculator he needed for math the next day. Before he could get another word out of his mouth, I exploded. What am I, the delivery boy for the world? Do you have a clue what my day has been like? Whatever happened to really learning math instead of learning how to use a calculator that does it for you? Is this what I'm paying for you, for you at that school of yours? I walked to the car, and he followed at a great distance behind me. Waiting outside the store, I examined my shattered hopes, wishing someone would pay a little attention to me, and angry with people who had gotten in my way. I suggested we pick up a couple pizzas for supper, drove home in silence, stored the ingredients for my Cuban meal, and went into the living room to sulk. He writes, don't miss the point of this story. My anger was not caused by the people and situations I encountered. My anger was caused by completely legitimate desires that came wrongly to rule me. By the time I had finished shopping for the Cuban meal, I was holding the desire for a relaxing evening with a closed fist. But God had another plan. He had arranged to give me an evening where I could serve him by serving my family. He gave me the blessing of giving, the joy of laying down my life for others. Yet I did not see it because I was ruled by my own desires. Beneath my war with people, the war for my heart was raging. Well, if the shoe fits. <laughs> I don't know if there's one of us in here that hasn't lived that exact same scenario with different particulars out at some point in our life. Often exploding on the people that we love the most letting all of the junk pour out. Not because our desires are wrong, but because they're inordinate. And we no longer want to seek first the kingdom of God, but rather our own. We've taken a good desire and turned it into a demand, a need, an expectation that we will punish people if they don't meet. How do you think God feels about that? Because here's the thing, God not only loves you, he loves the people that you explode on. We don't have to wonder, James tells us in verse four, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it of no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? On the one hand, we declare our friendship with the world when we turn our desire for good things into God things. But when we do this, God is not neutral toward us. No, God responds like a jealous husband who loves his wife, even in the midst of our spiritual adultery. What we would expect is for the hammer of God's anger to finally fall. What we would expect is for God to serve us with spiritual divorce papers saying, I'll find someone else. 
I mean, how, how could he possibly take us back when our eyes wander like that so frequently? But listen to what James says next in verse 6. But he gives more grace. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God gives more grace. Grace, humble yourself, submit yourself to God. Now hold on to those thoughts for just a minute because all of a sudden we've got a new player in the, in the game, don't we? He says in verse seven, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now I think we could all admit if it was only the war that was going on within me that produces a war that, among us, that would be challenging enough, wouldn't it? But James cues us into one more plane of the battlefield, one more dimension of the battle raging. And he says, in every conflict, there is a spiritual battle raging above me as well. So not only do I have my own messed up desires raging inside of me, not only do I have to deal with other people who have their own desires and battles raging inside of them, but now I have to consider the devil a spiritually evil person who wants nothing more than to destroy me and to destroy the rest of God's people? Yeah, no sweat. There is a battle among us, a battle within us, and a battle above us. The battle above us, the spiritual dimension, is very real. And yet, in cultures like ours, it just kind of feels a little bit like a fairy tale, doesn't it? We have a little understanding of the spiritual realm but we've gotten so good at explaining it away by giving it some other diagnosis or some other explanation. But make no mistake about it, the devil is real and he is at work in our midst. Satan and his demons want nothing more than to destroy us and divide us as the people of God. We must be aware of this reality without at the same time obsessing over this reality. See, C.S. Lewis used to say there are two equal and opposite heirs when it comes to the demonic realm. On the one hand, we can live as if it doesn't exist, and then we're duped so easily. On the other extreme, we see a demon behind every corner. And he said, we must not fall into either of these extremes, but be aware that there is a spiritual battle that is raging above us in addition to the one within us and among us. But here's the truth about Satan, or the devil. Resist the devil, and he will flee. He would like nothing more than to turn a good, God-given desire into a consuming demand and God replacement and idol. But we're promised that if we resist him, he will flee. Why? Because his power is limited. What hope do we have? Much, actually. Why? Because it begins with God's initiating. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then we're given a prescription in verses 8 to 10. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be torn to mourning and your joy, joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. The solution begins with receiving God's grace, with the reality that we have all screwed up, that none of us have been able to keep our desires in check. And it's not that we desire too much, it's that we are far too easily satisfied by things that don't actually des meet those desires. That's what created things are. They're good things, but they don't replace God. They can't. How could they? They're meant to point us to him as a good and benevolent creator. But this very reason is why Jesus came into the earth, to save sinners, to bring grace and salvation to you and I who were unworthy. But he gives more grace. Verses 6 to 10 give us four steps in turning this around. The first is receive God's grace humbly by acknowledging your need. Oh, what good news it is, but he gives more grace. You might think that your sin is so bad that God could never forgive you, but he gives more grace. He covers it. The death of Jesus was sufficient for you. Receive that. Why would God do that? 
because he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Even though we have made friends with the world and committed spiritual adultery on him as our husband, he yearns over us like a jealous husband, not a demanding one, rather one who would by grace receive us back because he's willing to bear the penalty for our adultery himself. He loves us with a jealous love, meaning that he's not content to share us. James says, don't go back to friendship with the world. Receive his grace. Second, submit yourself to God's rule. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Stop thinking that you are the center of the universe. Stop believing that you can do the job, a good job, calling all the shots in your life. Submit to God's rule. What does that mean? It means it's submitting to his word and to his commandments because he's smarter than you because he knows the way to truly live life. Submitting to these things, not to earn life, we never could, but because you have life in him, and he has graciously given it to you. Step three, resist the devil. And did you catch the promise? And he will flee from you. Satan is powerful, but his power is limited by an even greater power, a power that now lives inside you through the work of Jesus Christ, the very Holy Spirit of God. And step four, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So what is it? Is God going to draw near to me first, or am I going to draw near to God? Yes. Yes. We're for both. I, I draw near to God, and he responds with his near presence. He draws near to me and produces in me a desire to draw near to him. It's like a dating relationship. Often one person initiates and pursues, but if that's the only person who ever initiates and pursues, it doesn't go very far. The other person must respond and begin to pursue as well, and that's what creates a sweetness and an intimacy. We are told, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Know this, if you're sitting here today, and your heart is not hating every word that comes from James, God is drawing near to you. He is wooing you. Draw near to him. Know this, when your desire is to draw near to him, he is right there, drawing near to you. How do I draw near to God? Verses 8 to 10 tell me. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Well, that sounds fun, doesn't it? Is God asking us then to hate ourselves? To, to take on this like wretch or worm theology? No, I don't think so. If I had to summarize, I would say it this way. It's not so much that we need to hate ourselves as much as it is we need to see ourselves and see God rightly. See, when we see God rightly, we then see the sin in our life and we see it for what it is. It will inevitably lead to us humbling ourselves because when those two things are compared, we don't look so good. We acknowledge our need. And as we acknowledge our need, he draws near to us. How do I know that? Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who acknowledge their poverty of spirit. They are the one who inherit the kingdom. Or as verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, if there's anybody in the room here that's still proud, maybe we should go back through that list of six things again. Maybe should I, I should articulate for you how a desire gets so out of control in such a hurry. Humble yourselves, and he will shower you with more grace. He will draw near to you, not because you are worthy or deserving, but because Jesus is. Now, as we leave from here, a couple questions that maybe would be helpful. So you think about, how does this apply to my life? Is there, is there anyone that you are in conflict right now that you need to be reconciled with? In that conflict, how have you contributed to it? Are there any good but now misaligned desires in your, on, on your end that have further complicated things? What have you brought to the table? Have, have, has a desire for good things in your life gotten too big and gotten too great a hold on your life? Fourth, in a different way, have you largely ignored the spiritual realm at great peril to your soul? 
In what way might there be a battle raging above you that you are completely unaware of? See, just as it is unbelievably insightful to understand the inworkings of our heart and the battle that rages inside of us, so often sometimes it is mind-blowing to acknowledge that there is a battle raging above us. We get the conflict among us. We experience that all the time. So what hope do we have? Much. Receive God's grace in Jesus Christ. Submit to God's rule and reign in your life and find that in doing that you truly live. Resist the devil knowing that he must flee from you, not because of your power and authority, but because of who lives within you. And finally, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. See, I can't promise you a church that is free of conflict. Such a thing does not exist on this side of heaven. But what I can promise you is a group of people that will humbly do the hard work in our own hearts so that we might not let the battles rage among us and within us and above us and destroy the work that God wants to do through us. See, we can acknowledge those things without getting off track with the work that God wants to do through us. Let's, let's pray. God, thank you for your word and how it gives us insight into our own hearts and souls. Would you help us to desire you above all that you might lead us into peace? God, help us to submit to your kingdom rule because it's good news. Father, would you help us to be reconciled one with another that we might live at peace while the world rages. We have nothing but love and peace among the people of God. God, would you do that in us? Would you do that among us? And would you protect us in the battle that rages above us? We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna transition now in our worship service to a time of communion where we remember the body of Jesus broken for us and the blood of Jesus shed for us. We're gonna do this as we sing. And so as we turn our hearts to the communion table, some of you guys have never eaten this meal before in faith and some of you have eaten it a thousand times. Well, here's the thing. Just because you ate and drank yesterday doesn't mean that you don't need to eat and drink today. In the same way, just because you remembered the gospel yesterday doesn't mean that you don't need to today remember Jesus' body broken for you and his blood shed for you. So that's what we do together as the people of God, regularly. When we gather, we remind us of these great things because he gives us more grace. And even something like a little wafer, a cracker, and a little cup of juice reminds us in a tangible way of the body of Jesus that was broken for you. The blood of Jesus that was shed for you, that you might know the love of God, that you might receive it afresh, that you might take it in like you take in food, so to speak. So here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, then you are welcome to come and receive the communion elements, remembering his body broken and his blood shed for you. If you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I have two invitations for you. One, today could be the day. Today might be the day that you say, I need him to save me. I see my sin. I see how my desires are so out of control sometimes that it spills out into the lives of other people. I see that so clearly now. What hope do I have? There is much hope at this table because of what it represents. Run to Jesus. Believe in him. Trust in him and receive his grace. If you do that this morning, you are welcome at this table, whether you're a member of our church or not. However, if you're here this morning and you realize, I'm just not there, Pastor Kyle. I'm, I'm intrigued or I came out of obligation, but those things aren't true in my life. I'm, I'm not a follower of Jesus. I just want to say, I'm really glad you're here. Thanks for checking things out. In fact, we've all been there before, but here's what I would ask. Don't testify to something that isn't true about your life. Just feel comfortable sitting in your seat. No one's going to judge you. In fact, we've all been there before. Remain in your seat and maybe ponder these realities. Ponder how your own heart works and at least see the wisdom in what God has said. And maybe, maybe pursue that friend who invited you and ask some more questions that you might get to the bottom of this faith thing. So if you are a follower of Jesus or if for, for 20 years or, to, or today, you are welcome to remember his body broken for you and his blood shed for you. Let's pray. God, thank you for these communion elements that remind us of your goodness. God, you are great. Jesus, you loved us with an extraordinary love, one that shed his own blood. And so we now remember your body broken and your blood shed for us. 
and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would come down the center of aisle, uh, someone will hand you the communion elements so you can return down the side aisle and, and, and partake of it as we sing together. Would you come?
Let's pray. Father, you never change in your holiness, in your glory, but you also never change in your love for us, in your regard for us, in your mercy toward us, in your grace toward us. Remind us every hour, every day of your unchanging, steady, never-ending love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can take a seat. Um, if you haven't met me before, that's okay. I'm, I'm relatively new here now, but I've met quite a few of you now, and it's, it's actually good to start to remember uh, names and, and full, full faces now. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, if you are new here, or even if you've been here a long time, uh, the best way to connect with us is on this bulletin or in, with a QR code in front of you. There's a connect panel on here, and you can put that along with an offering, if, if you have that, in one of the boxes on the side or in the back there. Um, you can fill out prayer requests there as well or find out about some, some events that we have coming up. There is one event I wanted to uh, extend and invite you to. Um, that's for our city group leaders who are currently leading a city group or if you are out there and God has put it on your heart of maybe in the future I want to lead a city group, uh, maybe in the near future, in the, in the summer or fall. Um, next Sunday, so not this Sunday, but next Sunday night from 6 to 8 uh, p.m., we're going to be meeting in this room, uh, and we'll be talking about the year we just had, which, you know, like 2020 is, you know, kind of been an, an up and down, um, and then look ahead toward the summer and fall. Um, so if you do want to come to that, you can mark it on, on here on the Connect card. You can let me know. Uh, now Robert is going to come up and share the rest of our announcements. Come on up, Robert. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Robert, and I am the Children's Ministry Director at Rock Hill. I'm excited to tell you that things are booming downstairs. We have a new check-in system, we have new classrooms, lots of kids are coming back. I think what's really cool is that while God is working up here, while Kyle is preaching or we're singing, some people are believing in Jesus for the very first time, and others are deepening their faith. The same thing is happening downstairs. While we're all up here, downstairs, Children are believing in Jesus for the very first time. Children are deepening their faith, and you can be part of that. I'm taking applications for the kids' ministry team for the summer. We're looking for teachers and assistants. If you're interested, please come talk to me after. I'll be hanging out in the back. Or email robert at rockhillcc.org. One more thing. One thing several of my volunteers have told me is that they get more out of the lesson than the kids do. Because when you teach a lesson, you end up learning it yourself, right? In fact, today's lesson was about Stephen. Here is a quote from the preschool lesson. <clears throat> people hurt Stephen because he followed Jesus. When people are mean to you because you love Jesus, you can be brave because people hurt Jesus too. When people are mean to you because you love Jesus, you can be brave because people hurt Jesus too. You know how relevant that is? I sent that to three adults this week. <laughs> I keep thinking about it. So if you want to grow deeper in your own faith, join the kids team. Robert at rockhillcc.org or talk to me after. It's like a Bible study for you, but you also get animal crackers. We have two more announcements, uh, foundations membership class. Uh, if you've been coming to Rock Hill for a while and you're interested in membership, finding out what the church is about a little deeper, um, that's on Thursday, May 20th at 6.30 at the office. Scan the QR code uh, or email paul at rockhillcc.org. Um, if you've placed your faith in Jesus and haven't been publicly baptized yet to, to profess that, um, we are having a baptism on May 30th as well. So QR code or email paul. Uh, Rock Hill, you are now not dismissed, but you're sent to declare the gospel, to display the gospel, and to delight in the gospel. See you next week.